Hello, and welcome to the first in a series of webinars on advances in reproductive medicine. I am Mark Trollis, the director of the Fertility Center of Assisted Reproduction and Endocrinology in Orlando, Florida, as well as the associate professor at the University of Central Florida. My esteemed colleagues will be joining me for provocative discussion on the latest in the areas of assisted reproduction. And this is going to be a very, very exciting 30 minutes to elucidate the most compelling findings that are in our field. I would like to thank Viver Health. It's all about life. They are the sponsor of this event, and they are a growing center of reproductive centers of excellence across the country. I would like to now give my colleagues an opportunity to introduce themselves, and we first go to Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Jot Peter Nagy and I am the scientific director at Reproductive Biology Associates, and I'm also the founder of my egg bank that is also located here in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Peter. And then we go to Norfolk, Virginia. Hi, I'm Laurel Statmauer. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Eastern Virginia Medical School and uh, the Jones Institute I am the medical director for SART. Thank you, Laura, and welcome. And now to Dallas, Texas. Hi, my name is Anil Pinto. I'm the medical director at Dallas Viver Surgery Center. It's all about life. And a member of the faculty here at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, Anil. I am very, very happy to have my esteemed colleagues today. These key opinion leaders are going to be speaking about two of the most compelling topics in our field today. The first is on oocyte crop preservation or egg freezing, and the other is on pre-implantation genetic screening. So we flip the coin, and Peter is going to be the first one that's going to be answering the questions about egg freezing. Peter. The process of egg freezing has taken a development from the method of slow freezing to now the more advanced method of vitrification. Can you just educate us on this new technology of vitrification and how this will benefit patients? Oh yes, absolutely. As you just thought, you know, what we have experienced in the last uh, two, three years, a uh, very big advancement in oocyte cryopreservation. As you described, you know, oocyte cryopreservation has been performed using the slow freezing technique. It has been reported back in 1986, the first success with this technique. However, for about 20 years, there has not been a consistent high success because it was a very low survival. It was probably around 20 to 30 percent survival with slow freezing. So it was not used clinically. It has been only just very recently. Uh, changing the technique to vitrification or very fast ultra rapid freezing uh, when it was possible to achieve somewhere around 80 to 90 percent survival rates of all sites which also helped to improve the pregnancy and implantation rates with slow freezing maybe five to ten percent pregnancy rates at the best uh, with vitrification you can get as high as you have also in the fresh uh, cycles so basically you can go up to 50 60 percent in egg donation cycles and in young IVF patients it's a very big advancement now the the slow method of, of freezing there was a problem with the uh, with the uh, water content and ice crystal formation of the eggs and that seemed to have been the biggest challenge to pregnancy rates and damaging the egg correct yes that's correct uh, indeed the slow freezing was not able to prevent ice crystallization, which is, you know, the biggest enemy uh, for uh, oocyte uh, cryopreservation. Although for embryo freezing, slow freezing technique worked very well since 83, uh, the same was not possible to repeat for oocytes. Doing vitrification, you are able to completely eliminate ice crystallization, but you cannot do really with slow freezing. So it gave a very important change in the technology and it gave a very important impact on the outcomes. Uh, while we're doing OSAC crowd preservation with vitrification, do you think that es essentially all clinics are moving toward this technology for uh, embryo freezing? And if so, uh, are we seeing better pregnancy rates with embryos using vitrification? There is no question about it. 
you know, when we introduced uh, vitrification here at RBA in 2005-2006, uh, we were not really expecting these excellent outcomes, uh, but it was working very well for all sides. And we had also great results for embryo freezing using the slow freezing technique. Uh, so we were a little bit reluctant in the very beginning to change over vitrification for embryos, but we did change over and we have seen increase of survival rates of embryos and even higher pregnancy rates and implantation rates when we use embryo freezing with the vitrification technique. And there is no question that I think most of the clinics is going to change because even in Italy where slow freezing for all site cryopreservation has been the best established, now basically all clinics has changed to vitrification. Thank you, Peter. Uh, excellent commentary. And Neil, Absolutely. what experience do you have with egg freezing uh, in terms of patients' age and their reason for the request, and what type of pregnancy rates are you seeing? That was a great question. Uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in the recent past in patients and physicians calling us to inquire about egg freezing. Most of these inquiries have been prompted by a diagnosis of cancer in these patients. Freezing oocytes rather than eggs in this particular segment of the population I think is a very valid and reasonable request because it avoids the legal as well as the ethical issues surrounding embryo storage and could also be surrounding embryo disposable so the patients opt not to use them. The biggest issue with freezing oocytes in the cancer patients has been that there's very little data in terms of pregnancy outcome. These patients freeze their eggs, but very few of them come forward eventually to use them. Uh, in our program, we have seen a situation wherein we've taken a patient to egg retrieval and unfortunately have had poor sperm or no sperm on the day of retrieval. These patients are great, great candidates for um, egg freezing. Uh, some, some couples may wish to delay childbearing. And I want to bring this up to the forefront because many a program have been advocating that we should be offering egg freezing to help these patients uh, avoid the inevitable decline in both egg quality and uh, egg numbers uh, as we age some. It is important, however, when you're talking to these patients to be very clear in your mind and discuss with them both the age-specific as well as your clinic-specific data in, in these patients. Um, some of our patients will, and I'm sure Peter, and as well as Dr. Stadmeyer, and even you, Dr. Trollis, have noted that patients come to you and say, well, we don't want to have all our eggs fertilized. We would like maybe four eggs fertilized. And these are couples who are struggling with the legal as well as the religious or moral issues with supernumerary embryos that we may never, ever use. And I think oocyte cryopreservation would be an excellent, excellent uh, alternative to these patients. And I say this because given that around 95 oocytes, percent of the oocytes will survive the freeze and thaw with a fertilization rate of about 75 percent and a clinical pregnancy rate per transfer appear, approaching close to 60 percent, I think the time has come to remove the label experimental from this procedure to standard of care. In fact, we in our program are exploring the possibility of setting up a universal egg donor bank. This would be fantastic for our patients because it could circumvent the entire logistics of a fresh donor egg program and on the other hand I think it will be cheaper as well. Very interesting comments on this topic. It's obviously a very provocative uh, discussion in, and you elucidated uh, important points on the application of egg freezing and who would be most likely to benefit. We're going to be speaking about uh, fertility preservation in cancer patients in, in a few moments but I wanted to turn to Laurel and, and bring up something that you just touched upon. In the 1990s, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, uh, better known in the acronym uh, of ICSI, was experimental at that time. And then the American Society of Reproductive Medicine had removed that designation. Right now, uh, the label for OSI crowd preservation is experimental. And I just wanted Laura to touch on that, what implications she thinks that has, and what the future may hold for that designation. Yeah, actually we use egg freezing for, uh, for all the indications that we just spoke about. But um, there have been now over 2,000 reported births from egg freezing, mostly in the young patient population from egg donors or young women. 
but all the children uh, born from vitrified oocytes, there have been no increase in developmental abnormalities or any genetic defects. So actually, the ASRM currently is reviewing the um, experimental um, label, and, uh, and most likely that will be removed in the near future because there is enough evidence that is very reassuring and enough babies born at this point that there doesn't seem to be any risks, increased risk from uh, just regular IVF. So this will be very, very helpful because right now we're doing it under an IRB protocol and uh, it's important to collect the data, but, it, but um, it's become such a worldwide accepted uh, procedure that the label should be coming off soon. I'll open this up to the rest of the colleagues. What applications do you think right now in 2012 is most likely to apply for egg freezing? If I may uh, start uh, with some comments on it, um, you know, I think that we all expected that it would be for fertility preservation, the first use of oocyte cryopreservation. Uh, interestingly, even though that we see some patients coming in for both medical and social reasons for fertility preservation, uh, the first use, as you just heard it, for uh, donor egg banking. And uh, here at RBA, we have established the donor egg bank back in 2006 and started to work with it about 2007-2008 and uh, up to you know, nearly 1,000 recipients has used already this bank. So uh, there is a huge amount of interest about this bank and we have had more than 600 live births uh, following oocyte vitrification from the donor egg bank. So I think you know, in the very near future uh, donor egg banks will work the same way like sperm banks and probably provide a lot of benefit for recipients. But then the, the very, FDA may get a hold of this, and then they will most likely require the six-month quarantine that they require with sperm banking. That would make sense, yes. Well, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, that's been a, an issue that's come about uh, with the FDA because this is tissue donation. So we are under the auspices of the FDA on how we handle eggs, sperm, and embryos just to uh, provide more, more information to, to our ob colleagues who, who are listening. Yes, Anil. I think that what Dr. Nagy said was, was absolutely correct. I think the future would be fertility preservation because people are delaying childbirth now and establishing an egg bank. I think that would be the real future. And I, 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 I could, you couldn't be more right in, in highlighting that. It's interesting that you all have over 600 births. So you all, might, you, all, you all should be considered as the pioneers in your field in terms of establishing an egg bank. Absolutely, and since you brought up the, the topic of fertility preservation, that's where we go next, uh, uh, back to Laurel. Uh, this is probably the most beneficent uh, area that we could be helping those uh, afflicted with cancer. And because our oncology colleagues are doing such a great job right now in, in, in prolonging the life of these patients in their reproductive age, they are now being faced with surviving cancer but infertility. Laura, could you comment on the options for fertility preservation in cancer patients, particularly with, in regard to egg freezing? Yes, I can. I mean, we see a combination of young children with leukemias and lymphomas, and uh, then older women, but a childbearing age, mostly with breast cancer and uh, other uh, blood cancers that are receiving alkylating agents or chemotherapeutic agents that are toxic to the to the ovaries. And uh, the oocyte cryopreservation right now is our number one um, te uh, off technique that we offer the patients. And it, because it requires minimally invasive uh, protocols, ovarian stimulation protocols, and uh, no surgery is required. And there have been such high success with the, with the young donors. But um, we are in contact with the, with the oncologist because you usually need a minimum of 12 to 14 days for stimulation and uh, for the procedure. And we want to make sure that everything is okay with them. And for breast cancer patients, there are protocols such as using the letrozole where the estradiol levels can be lowered and uh, 
the oncologists uh, recommend that protocol to reduce the estrogen exposure in breast cancer patients. I was just going to ask you just to quickly comment on, on the contraindications uh, that are in this field today. Are there patients that you would just say they are not candidates for fertility preservation? Well, if you have uh, the, if the cancer involves the ovary, there's controversial uh, contraindications. And in young girls, you can't really do ovarian stimulation. So those are the ones that we are offering egg uh, ovarian tissue freezing to, but that requires a surgical procedure and it's very experimental. And, uh, and then we're also offering it to uh, women who have benign ovarian disease such as endometriosis or, their, or a dermoid cyst where they're going to lose an ovary or that could be their only ovary that they are surgically removing. And, um, and I, I mean, there are very few, there are very few contraindications, only if they, or, or if they need surgery right away. The hardest thing when we get into something of this nature is that it is, it is uh, very uh, brand new, uh, new information is coming out and we all are very excited to talk about this. But in the interest of time, I, I think we need to switch on to the field of pre-implantation genetic screening. I'm going to be going back to Peter now because uh, several years ago, five to ten years ago, screening embryos in the laboratory, we wanted to try to enhance the implantation potential of the embryo by selecting the best embryo. And the technique uh, using fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, was initially used, but we found that there were limited numbers of chromosomes and not uh, enough information to be able to improve the outcome. Now, with technologies of comparative genome hybridization and microarray, we are getting better results. Peter, could you tell us where we are right now in 2012? Yes, absolutely. And um, you already gave some very good points about uh, PGD or PGS, uh, as it is uh, abbreviated. Uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, PGS when started chromosome uh, screening uh, was back maybe 20 years ago, and indeed it was fluorescent in situ hybridization, uh, which is a kind of way to visualize uh, the chromosomes uh, inside of the nucleus. Uh, it is also very important to remember that at back at that days, uh, when we used fish, uh, we also did embryo biopsy at a specific stage, and that specific stage what was the day three of embryo development. And I want to emphasize this because it is playing a very critical role, you know, why we didn't get really uh, more improved results when we were doing the fish uh, PGS. Now, what has happened is that, as you just mentioned, uh, when using fish, the number of chromosomes uh, that you can visualize or you can test for is limited. You know, there are 23 chromosomal pairs uh, in every human uh, cell, and with fish, uh, you can diagnose typically somewhere between 5 and 11. So, uh, basically, the larger part of the chromosomes, you just simply don't have information. And that's uh, a very critical point also about the, using the fish technique. Uh, compared to that, uh, when you use the CGH, which is a more recent technique, only just a couple of years ago when it has been established, with CGH technique, you can uh, look at all the chromosomes. So all 23 chromosomes, you are getting diagnostic information, which is also extremely important. And now let's get back to the other point, uh, the stage of embryo biopsy. You know, at day three, the human embryo well, uh, has... Let, let me just... Peter, I'm sorry. Let, I'm going to jump into that. Yes. Because that's a question that's coming up, and I don't want to cut that short. Okay. It's very very, very important to talk about day three versus day five. So while we're talking about PGS, I, I thought we'd go now to Dr. Pinto and say, uh, Anil, in your experience, what patients are requesting PGS and which patients do you think are benefiting from that and what type of outcome are you seeing in the patients that you're applying this to? The most common indication in our, in our practice has been in patients who are having recurrent miscarriages associated with aneuploidy and patients with single gene disorders. Uh, we've been offering PGS in patients with recurrent miscarriage here for quite a while now, and I've noticed in those patients who have undergone IVF with PGS screen, we are able to select the euploid embryos for transfer, and thereby resulting in a pretty dramatic decrease in misca subsequent miscarriage risk. Uh, I don't want to take away the, the limelight, but we biopsy our embryos on day five and that is because of the decreased incidence of mosaicism in a day five embryo. Uh, as far as the single gene disorders are concerned, 
we do offer and we have done uh, cycles in patients in whom uh, they had, they're on the risk of uh, having an offspring with cystic fibrosis, uh, Huntington's chorea, neurofibromatosis, just to name a few. And this technology has allowed us to select the, the normal embryos for transfer. We now have purely migrated from the old freeze technique to vitrification. And because of the better outcome in terms of embryo survival, we do a biopsy on day five, vitrify the embryos, and call the patients in for a frozen cycle subsequently. Overall, I will say that in, in the setting of recurrent miscarriages, we have seen a dramatic improvement in pregnancy outcome. The cost for the whole procedure is around $5,000 over and above the traditional IVF costs. Uh, what we're trying to pursue right now is, is the possibility, and the, the data is not all out there, is that should we be offering PGD and PGS routinely to all patients who are 38 and above who will be pursuing an IVF cycle, given the high risk of chromosomal aneuploidy in this patient's group. Uh, we are exploring this option, but till date we have not yet offered it. But that's been our stand in terms of offering these treatments to our patients. Thank you, Anil. Uh, excellent commentary. And along that same line, I wanted to switch to Dr. Sapmau. Laurel, um, uh, patients, uh, I've seen it at, at, at some of our meetings, of course, uh, by abstracts or, 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 or lectures. Uh, some programs are advocating applying PGS to all patients or, or even egg donors. What patient population do you think would benefit most from the chromosomal screening? And to follow up with that, I'd like you to comment and, and to allay some anxiety and also maybe to, to expound on, could the biopsy at all be harming the embryo's ability to implant? So please comment. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we don't believe at, at our institute that PGS should be offered to all women. They should be offered to women who will benefit from them because it's important to determine how many embryos that they have. So women who are over 38 years of age but who produce many embryos, this is the ideal case for them because they have a lower likelihood of, of having no euploid embryos to transfer. So when you look at the pregnancy rates, it, it should be per retrieval and not per transfer. And some of the uh, women over 40 who only have three or four embryos, unless they are you know, strictly doing it to where they have a history of, uh, of an aneuploidy or a child with uh, chromosomal abnormalities, that they have such a high likelihood of not making it to transfer, and some of the embryos may not make it to blastocysts that may be chromosomally normal, and they may have a better chance of getting pregnant if they just transferred the embryos on day three. So it is still uh, out there, but patients with recurrent miscarriages, patients uh, with a history of genetic abnormalities, or with children with genetic abnormalities, those are the perfect patients. And patients over 38 who produce a large number of embryos they have the highest likelihood of having a euploid uh, embryo to transfer. And if they do, then their pregnancy chances are the same as younger women. So it's very, very beneficial. And there is, a, I agree, an advantage of, uh, of biopsying at the blastocyst stage, but you may lose some euploid embryos along the way. Uh, just to follow up with that, what I have discussed with, with my patients, uh, the dilemma in offering PGS to women above 38 or with any diminished ovarian reserve is that you may, on day three of embryo development, have all the embryos that you're going to feel comfortable transferring anyway, irrespective of, right. of the results. So do you spend, uh, expend the cost of a biopsy or transfer the embryos? It becomes more difficult, uh, and that's where, where the discussion with the patient is important. But the information right. is obviously very, very valuable if you biopsy on day three, but that brings us to the day five biopsy. Before we get into that, I just wanted to, your comments. Are, are we doing any harm in your mind of embryo biopsy? Obviously, uh, PGD for, for single gene defects has been uh, in existence since 1990. Um, there was some concern about lower implantation rate in, in the biopsied embryo. Are you seeing any decrease in implantation 
because solely the embryo was biopsied? Uh, you, you can do biopsy at different stages, as I mentioned. One at the egg, 2 p.m. stage, polar body biopsy. You can make uh, also diagnostic test on that, although it will be only maternal. Uh, you can do previous stage, day three. You can do at blastocyst stage. The embryo is the strongest when it's more developed, which is the blastocyst stage. So you do less damage on the embryo if you do it on day five or day six. No question about it. You eliminate the mosaicism, as you just heard it before. And you get more material. You can take out more cells. So your diagnostic power will be much higher. So you can be more sure about the results than what you obtain. So there is really no question that, you know, blastocyst stage biopsy is the best stage of biopsy. I also agree absolutely with Dr. Stadtmeier that when we do embryo biopsy, it's not always helping the patient. That, that what you told also, if there are only one or two embryos, you are not really helping the patient. But even if there are 20 embryos, you are not really doing anything else, then you are selecting the embryo that has a better chance to implant. And this is nothing else than time to pregnancy. So if you are selecting embryos in one way or the other, with PGS, for instance, you are just getting you know, the time reduced to a possible pregnancy. But if you transfer all 20 embryos, at the end you are there without PGS also. Let's, let's touch upon this because this is, this is getting to be very, very interesting. On the day of biopsy, I think a lot of information now is, is compelling in our literature that the later uh, embryo, the more advanced embryo, the more accuracy we're getting from the, from the biopsy itself uh, using microarray or comparative genome hybridization. So if we are moving the trend toward a day five biopsy at the blastocyst stage, now what do we do? Do we wait for the information to come back, which could be a day, and then transfer on day six of embryo development, which is sort of a new frontier or, or, or pushing the envelope, as it were, or do we vitrify all the embryos on day five and then have the patient come back for a frozen embryo replacement? I'll throw this out to all of you. In our program, we, we biopsy the patients day five, vitrify, and bring them in for a frozen cycle. And that's because we have an excellent freeze-thaw survival uh, following vitrification. Uh, we don't have much data on day six embryo transfer in terms of outcomes, and I think that's the main reason why we adopt this process, this, this particular path. It's up to you. Uh, what do you all do, Peter? Uh, we do exactly the same. Uh, do uh, day five, day six blastocyst stage biopsy, uh, vitrify the embryos. And did I just to uh, get back to the original first point, you know, that vitrification is a much more powerful technique than slow freezing. With slow freezing, you were not able to do that. You know, if you biopsy an embryo and you did slow freezing, that embryo did not survive. With vitrification, Correct. it comes out nearly as perfect as it was before vitrification. So it works really excellently. Mm -hmm. And also we have the experience that uh, the uh, implantation and pregnancy rates in a frozen embryo transfer cycle is typically even higher than in a fresh uh, transfer cycle if you transfer the same embryo. So it's, it's really, I think the receptivity is better for many different reasons. Uh, do you think it's to do with endometrial receptivity that the frozen em frozen transfer cycle pregnancy rates tend to be better because we don't have supraphysiological estrogen floating in her system? Just a thought. Yeah, there are studies that are that are demonstrating that if you compare fresh versus frozen, uh, you'll 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 have higher pregnancy rates in the frozen, particularly in the hyper-responding patient. So uh, it, it's very compelling to think that there may be supraphysiologic estradiol levels having a negative impact. On, on, on uh, endometrial receptivity. Uh, with that, uh, I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, time is unfortunately at the end, and I don't remember 30 minutes going by so quick. Uh, this has been terribly informative to me. Um, I, I know that our audience will benefit. Uh, I'm very honored and proud to have had a, a provocative discussion with such key opinion leaders. I want to thank Dr. Peter Nagy, uh, from Reproductive Biology Associates in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Laurel Stoutmauer uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, Eastern Virginia Medical School, and Dr. Neil Pinto uh, in, in Dallas. Thank you to Viver Health. It's about life for their sponsorship. And we look forward to seeing you all again in our next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.